History is being made right now in Allen Superior Court. For the first time, it's a majority female bench. Five of the nine judges are women. They just view us as any other lawyer. That's ultimately what we wanted to be. Today, the women judges in Allen Superior Court zip up the same black robes and take the highest seat in the courtroom. But their journeys to the bench and through a historically male-dominated legal field were very different. To say that it was difficult as a start is, is an understatement. When Judge Nancy Boyer graduated law school in 1976, she was one of the first women lawyers in Fort Wayne. I would be called honey or dear, but if I become angry or if I say what I really think, that's really not going to help either me or any other women coming to Fort Wayne. And so I, I think one of the biggest compliments I received after a couple of years of practice was, uh, you know, we really like you here because you practice law like a man. And so I said, well, thank you. And I thought, I don't know what that means. Uh, but I think maybe they had a stereotype in their, their mind of what a woman lawyer would look like, act like, be like and I wasn't that. Boyer was also the first female to become a judge in Allen County, taking the bench in 1991. I always hoped that maybe when I started and what I did would help other women. Judge Fran Gull joined Boyer in 1997, also fighting through barriers as an attorney before taking the bench. I was told by several major law firms here in town that um, they didn't have room for a woman lawyer or they already had their woman lawyer and I was, I was completely taken aback. I did not expect to see that in 1984. Judge Wendy Davis graduated from law school in 1990 and still experienced sexism in the courtroom. I think over the years I have felt that I had to be just a little bit better, just a little bit smarter. Davis became a judge in 2011. Even back in 2010, believe it or not, when I ran in my first election, I had a male lawyer tell me we don't need any more women judges. So, you know, what do you do with that? And I think that when you're in hard times like that, that defines who you are. I'm very appreciative of where we were, where we've been, uh, where we are now, um, and those that kind of blaze that trail for me and for others um, to not have it so hard, to not have it so rough. Judge Andrea Trevino became the fourth female Allen Superior Court judge last year. We can aspire to be what have typically been male-dominated positions. So I think it has just as much to do with our society and the changing of, of ideas as it does with women feeling empowered and believing in ourselves. And I think in a way, as evidenced by our community, lifting each other up. Then Judge Jennifer DeGroot, while serving as a magistrate for the last 20 years, is the newest Superior Court judge, taking the bench in January and tipping the scales to make it a female majority. We just work with great people, men and women, aware of the history and, and knowing where things have come. It's, it is significant because it is the first time and here we are in you know, 2019 being able to say that. I think it's pretty exciting. We are so fortunate in this community that we have such a broad talent of pool to select from that it can be replicated across the state and, and it should be. Hopefully it's sending a message um, to encourage young women to go seek their dreams. As these women rule day after day, decision after decision, they're continuing to open doors for the next generation and encouraging the women behind us to, to, to follow us and to succeed us. We as leaders need to celebrate each other and not tear each other down. Lifting people up can have a really profound effect um, and it can put good people in good places. Follow the dream. If you think you want to be a lawyer, whatever you think you want to be. According to the U.S. Census, 38% of lawyers are now women, and America's Quarterly reports women account for 33% of state and federal court judges. From the classic quilted stitching to the plethora of prints, it's easy to spot a Vera Bradley bag. They're seen all over the world, but the brand all started in a Fort Wayne basement with two women who saw a need and started sewing. So this is where all the magic happens back here. As Barbara Bradley-Backgard walks through the Vera the Bradley Design Center, 
a ping pong table serves as a reminder of her company's roots. This is where it was all started on the ping pong table in my basement. And we'd cut out the bags on here. Just around the corner, a store bursting with bright bags showcases how far the brand has come. Prints and solids and, um, of course, the rolling luggage I loved. February 1982. Barbara and her friend Patricia Miller were sitting in an airport coming home to Fort Wayne from a trip to Florida when the idea was planted. No one has any decent looking, fun, feminine luggage, all black bags and all that. So I think that was probably the seed of the idea. Not that we said, let's go home and start a company. It's just that was the first recollection I have of, wait a minute, the world needs this, you know, and women need this. So they started cutting and sewing. And sent the bags to my daughters in college. And then they were calling back and saying, everyone loves these, Mom. The budding business started blooming. The overnight businesswomen placing ads in the paper to hire sewers. Women were coming and going to my home and were cutting the bags out, handing them the bags, the zippers, the thread, all that. They would take it home, sew it, bring it back, we'd inspect it, and that started it. And they never looked back. Did you ever doubt yourself? Uh, I don't think we stopped long enough to doubt ourselves because it went, it grew so quickly. Barb and Pat's brainchild became a booming business. We were a really good partnership. I, I considered myself more the creative and she was more the business. The women recognized as National Entrepreneurs of the Year in 1987, and Vera Bradley won Supplier of the Century at the Retailer Excellence Awards in 2017. And we were up against Hallmark Cards, oh, the, all the big, 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 big people. I was totally blown away by it. Did you ever experience challenges as being two women leading a company? I probably did, because men were always trying to tell you how to do it better. But I took that as an advantage, you know, oh, how should we do it better? Listen to the whole thing and then decide whether it's good advice or bad advice. I feel equal, always did. No one had to tell me I was. What advice do you have to young girls today? Say, follow your strengths. If you love makeup, go into makeup. You know, if you love teaching, then be a teacher. Do what you love, you know. I've never thought of the money as being the goal. How much money do you have? Because I don't think that really makes you happy. Uh, I think it's doing what you love is what makes you happy. As she celebrates her 80th birthday, Barb is still taking her own advice. I call myself the oldest living entrepreneur. Expanding the Backguard men's line and spreading her philanthropy beyond the Vera Bradley Foundation for Breast Cancer, which has raised millions of dollars, to now Alzheimer's research and working with the Fashion Institute in New York's Design for Disabilities program. Designing for people that cannot open a zipper the way we can, or reach a backpack, turn around and get a backpack. So that's a really, that has me very excited. While embracing the future. I love that velvet. A wall of prints and patterns of the past preserve the paisley path that is Vera Bradley. I'm very lucky, I'm a very lucky person. Veteran, mom, wife, cancer survivor, first woman mayor of Kendallville. Those are just some of the hats Mayor Suzanne Hanshu wears. But even with all those titles, Mayor Hanshu knows she couldn't do it alone. There isn't one day that I don't walk up those steps of this 100 plus year old building and realize the magnitude of the responsibility on my shoulders. Running a city is a big responsibility, but it's one Mayor Suzanne Hanshu has been preparing for her whole life. Well, I was born and raised on the east side of Detroit and I graduated from high school there. I was raised by a single mom. Without a clear direction after graduating high school, Hanshu enlisted in the United story. States Marine Corps. You can never ever use the female card, so and especially being in the Marine Corps. And she didn't. Hanshu worked through the ranks and broke down gender barriers. I was one of the first females to become a combat water survival instructor. 
and so I was real, real proud of that. She spent 11 years active duty and 13 years in the reserves. I never had an excuse. I never complained. And, you know, if you fall, you get cut, you get hurt, you just you suck it up and you just keep going because you want to be considered as one of them. Hanshu met her husband in the military, the parents to two children and now three grandchildren settled in Kendallville. It was her husband's hometown and one she would soon leave. Her military experience inspired her to run for office. It's always if you see something that needs corrected, you don't complain about it. You get involved and try to change it. She lost her bid for mayor in 1999. Four years later, she was still on active duty in the Marines, but she ran again, only officially in the race for a month, rising above resistance. I'm not from here. We've never had a female mayor of Kendallville, and you're crazy for even thinking about this. But she won. Mayor Suzanne Hanshu, the first woman mayor of Kendallville. In her re-election bid, there were literally signs some people did not want her there. It was um, lower my taxes and ease my woes, no more mayors and pantyhose. She took the slams in stride. I spent my entire adult life um, serving to, to protect that constitution and people have the right to say what they want to say and we have to go from there. I just made it a vow that every public meeting I attended, I would be in pantyhose and I have been. So it's kind of strange. I think I get inspired by somebody saying you can't do that. A bone marrow cancer diagnosis in 2016 wasn't going to stop her either. Actually, I worked from the hospital. I took my laptop and my cell phone with me. And the days that I felt good, I communicated with everybody. And because I love what I do, I think it helped me heal. Also helping her heal, Mayor Hanju's three granddaughters. She tells them grandma's girls go to college, and that's her message to all young girls. That little girl who may be in poverty, um, thinking she's not worthy of you know, her fellow classmates or going to college or whatever, um, that she is worthy of that. If you ask Mayor Hanshu how she does it all, she'll tell you she does it. I think it's because of my background in the Marine Corps. You're a team, and you're only as strong as your weakest link. A message she reinforced in this year's State of the City address. As always, I value the suggestions, emails, and phone calls from concerned citizens as they give me some of my best ideas. You people are so smart. May God continue to bless our great city and all of you. Thank you. But along the way, you know, each, each difficult thing that you get through, you gain more confidence in yourself and realize that you can do this, do a lot of self-talk. I can do this, I can do this. Mayor Hanshu is in her 15th year as mayor of Kendallville and is rerunning for a fifth term, all while being in remission. Typically, a bar scene looks like men putting a few beers back and talking about whatever sports team may be on the TV. Over at Hop River Brewing, they're changing that narrative. These are the fearless women. The fearless women emerged after a market research project from students at Indiana Tech in a zine called Girls Who Drink Beer collided. The research and interviews in the zine showed the need for monthly meetups of women. And I think being fearless doesn't mean you don't have a fear. And we're an amazing group who just want to make things easier for the next generation of women and try new things so that their level of fearlessness is even greater than ours. Despite being from a range of ages and professions, during the first meetup in January 2019, the women found commonalities between themselves. Really acknowledging that women have a tendency to apologize. We have a tendency to um, kind of keep our voice to ourselves and a little quieter, and that we do really do need to support each other in standing up and, and giving our opinions and um, acknowledging that we do have experiences and we do have, um, we do have really great ideas. The communal tables and the inclusivity Hop River provides allows the women to speak freely during the meetups. I would say right off the bat for me, I want other women to feel a sense of community, to feel included and to have a safe space where they can share their fears or their hopes and 
have a real support system. The group is still in its infancy and its creators plan to evolve fearless women to the needs of the women attending. This is a beautiful opportunity to get outside your bubble, get outside your lane, get outside your career, get outside your neighborhood, and you never know what mentors or friendships may develop just from hanging out, drinking a beer. Cheers to that. The next Fearless Women Meetup is the last Thursday of March, the 28th, but they are continuously adding events as they go along.